Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Antonio. And thank you so much uh, to the organizers of this, uh, this wonderful conference in this, uh, in this beautiful location. I'm learning all the joys of, uh, of Sicily, Sicilian food, Sicilian philosophy, Sicil Sicilian time. Um, <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really marvelous and, um, and unique. My topic today will, uh, will continue the, uh, the themes from this morning of consciousness and AI, especially with the focus on large language models, these models which have become absolutely ubiquitous everywhere in the last couple of years. You know, they're beginning to take over the world in so many respects, uh, you know, front page, on the front page of the newspapers on, uh, on many days. They're, they're revolutionized, they're beginning to revolutionize life in so many sectors, uh, whether it's a writing, uh, composition, programming, or even in my own sector of the, uh, you know, the academic world where, uh, where we're now starting to have to worry about all of our student papers being generated by, uh, by chat GPT. Um, so these, uh, these systems raise so many, so many different issues. Also, just very briefly, I take it most people know what a, uh, a large language model is. Here's the transformer architecture on which most of them run. I mean, language models have been around for a long time, especially in natural language processing, as uh, they're basically you know, a, a, lang a language model is any system that assigns probabilities to sequences of text. And they were first used for the study of, of syntactic and then semantic properties of language. They're basically systems for, you know, if you assign probabilities to sequences of text, you can use this to predict the next item in a sequence of text, and you can use the same capacity to generate new text. Uh, these models typically run on the transformer architecture, which I just illustrated, trained on an enormous amount of data from all over the internet with increasing numbers of parameters. I mean, the current craze of language models probably got started with BERT and GPT-1 back in 2018, only, only five years ago, and then with a sequence of ever more powerful models, GPT-2, GPT-3, Palm, Bard, uh, most recently, uh, the GPT-4 model is, uh, is extremely powerful. And what's interesting about these language models is that although initially set up as models of language, they turn out to have all kinds of unexpected capacities, what many people call emergent capacities, because they're basically trained just on the prediction of text, but it turns out that in order to predict text well, it helps to have all kinds of other capacities. So language models have turned out, surprisingly I think to, to almost everyone, to have these remarkable capacities that are really quite general and go far beyond linguistic skills to show at least what people think of as sparks of general intelligence. I mean, most obviously there's this there's facility with conversation and writing. I mean, yes, I can feed the standard, uh, the standard essay questions that I give my undergraduate classes to, uh, to chat GPT, and it does, a, it does a pretty good job. About a year ago, I said they did about as well as a medium first year undergraduate. But by now, actually, on GPT-4, I say it's now at the level of really a quite good advanced undergraduate who I'm ready to recommend to go to graduate school. Um, so conversation and writing, but also programming, also things like doing mathematics, um, doing science, uh, theoretical reasoning, even practical reasoning. You ask what is the best way to say to get to a certain place or to do a certain thing, it will give you very frequently a reasonable answer. These things will give explanations. Jeff Hinton, um, one of the gurus of deep learning, said what really, um, impressed him was when GPT-4 started to be able to actually explain jokes rather, uh, rather well. So, you know, I mean, these capacities are highly, highly imperfect. I mean, 
It's certainly not, not at, uh, in many domains, it's well short of a sophisticated adult human level, but the mere fact that it can uh, do these things at all, I mean, five years ago, all, pretty much all artificial intelligence was specialized intelligence. Systems were good at some specific task, like say, you know, playing Go or analyzing proteins and so on, whereas language models seem to have, seem to have at least elements of general intelligence, being good at a whole lot of different things. And although um, they're extremely limited and extremely fragile in many respects, if you look at where they're going, it's hard not to be you know, impressed and a little scared. Furthermore, there are many extended language models, what I'll call LLM pluses, which add further capacities to language models. I mean, language models started off just as text processes, but these days there's a lot of multimodal models which are connected to perception and action, which can process images, for example, in much the ways that others process text, you can connect up to a camera, you can connect up to a robot body, and it will actually you know, control a body and have a certain kinds of, of action. Language models have been extended with things like code execution, uh, database queries, as when people have combined, say, GPT-4 with Wolfram Alpha, uh, capacities for simulations, to do all kinds of things that go way beyond text. Now there are even agent models that use language models for planning and longer term action. So these, um, yeah, these models are just proving increasingly general and increasingly impressive. And these raise so many, look, I'm a philosopher. These raise so many philosophical questions. Some of these questions are in the domain of ethics. Are these systems safe? Are they fair? Or are they, uh, are they gonna be just full of biases? Are they responsible? Are they truthful? How do we get rid of you know, misinformation? There are questions about, there are also questions which I'll return to later about the, uh, the moral status of these language models. At some point, could they deserve some moral consideration in their own right? I'm, I'm not myself an ethicist, so I'm going to mostly set these ethics questions aside, although I may return to, to one or two of them. Um, but these questions, I mean, they actually raise questions in all kinds of areas of philosophy, in the philosophy of science, in the philosophy of language, in epistemology, in political philosophy. But my own specialty is the uh, philosophy of mind, so I'm especially interested in the questions these models raise there. For example, can these language models think and reason? Do they think and reason now? Might they think or reason sometime in the future? Do they genuinely understand language when they, when they process it? Are they agents? Can they act? Do they have any element of responsibility or free will? And of course, most salient for me and for many of you in this crowd is the question, can they be conscious? Are language models now conscious and might they be sometime in the future? I mean, this question hit the news, I guess, around this time last year when, uh, when an, an engineer at Google, Blake Lemoyne, said uh, he'd been working with one of Google's language models, Lambda 2, and he suggested that uh, he thought there was very strong evidence that, uh, that Lambda 2 was conscious, sentient, and maybe even had a soul. Uh, Google denied that and ended up, uh, ended up firing him, but this attracted a whole lot of attention, at least the beginning of some philosophical discussion. I mean, I think the initial reaction was at least very skeptical. A lot of people said, um, yeah, this, it's a stretch to say these systems are conscious. Um, there was, a, I think, Google's official line on this, as stated, said, a Google spokesperson said, we've reviewed Blake's concerns per our AI principles and have informed him that the evidence does not support his claims. He was told there was no evidence that Lambda was sentient and lots of evidence against it. Okay, so this got me interested. Um, 
evidence. Interesting. What is, in fact, the, uh, the, all this, this lots of evidence that Lambda is not sentient? That could be pretty useful to us in the, uh, in the science of consciousness if Google could, uh, could let us know. And really, this, uh, this talk is, to some extent, a uh, yeah, meditation on the question of what is the evidence in favor of these systems being conscious? What is the evidence against it? And where does that leave us, both with respect to current and future language models? I'm not going to have any definite answers by any means, but I just want to kind of sort through what I see as the best reasons for and against, with questions like, first, are current large language models conscious? Second, could future uh, language models and their extensions be conscious? Maybe in, uh, say, 10 years from now, if not now. And third, what challenges, what are the biggest challenges and obstacles on the path to conscious AI systems? Um, you know, what, if, there, if in fact there are good reasons why these models are not conscious, then what are those uh, what are those reasons, and is it possible they might be overcome? So uh, my plan is first I'll start by just clarifying some general issues about consciousness. Then I'll examine the best reasons that I can see in favor of language models being conscious, and I'll go on to examine the best reasons for thinking that language models are not or can't be conscious, and see you know, what they are, how strong they are, whether they might be overcome, then I'll draw some overall conclusions and you know, look at possible you know, roadmap between where we are now and the possibility of consciousness in these AI systems. Okay, so I'll start with, um, with consciousness. Uh, this crowd needs, uh, you know, it's pretty familiar with issues about consciousness. As I, I mean, people use the word consciousness a million different ways, as we've already seen. Um, at this conference, people in this field often, in debates over AI, often also use the word sentience, which can also be used in a million different ways. And so the terminology can get confusing. At least as I use the terms, consciousness and sentience are more or less interchangeable. They're both words for subjective experience. Anything that one experiences subjectively from a first-person point of view. So a being is conscious on this way of doing things if there's something it's like to be that being. This is the phrase made famous by my NYU colleague, Thomas Nagel, who back in the 70s wrote this article, what is it like to be a bat? Saying, okay, we don't know what it's like to be a bat using sonar to get around, but presumably there's something it's like to be a bat that is, the bat has some kind of subjective experience. If there is, then we say the bat is conscious. Presumably, there's nothing um, it's like to be this plastic cup. If not, then the plastic cup is not conscious. So the question then for AI is, you know, is there something it's like to be an AI system? The question that arises, say, for chat GPT is, is there actually something it's like to be chat GPT? while it's going through its processing. So this is what yeah, philosophers call phenomenal consciousness or just simply subjective experience. As I understand it, consciousness comes in many different types, many different modes. Those include, you know, the components of consciousness include sensory experience, like say, you know, seeing red, hearing music, Affective experience, experience with positive or negative valence, like feeling pain, feeling joy, feeling pain, feeling joy, feeling sadness. Cognitive experience, the experience of thinking and reasoning, so thinking hard. Agentive experience, experience of being an agent, of acting and so on, of deciding, of intending. And all of these can be combined with self-consciousness, that is, awareness of oneself. I don't want to say all consciousness is self-consciousness. I can be conscious of the world without necessarily being conscious of myself. Some animals may have, may have consciousness without self-consciousness, but self-consciousness is one important aspect of consciousness. It's worth distinguishing consciousness 
from many other things. Um, in particular, distinguishing consciousness from intelligence. Consciousness is a matter of subjective experience. Intelligence, I understood, is something which is tied much more closely to behavior. So intelligence is roughly sophisticated behavior and maybe sophisticated means and reasoning, um, trying to achieve certain things by finding the right means to those ends. I mean, consciousness goes along and is connected to intelligence in all kinds of ways, but they're not exactly the same thing. And in particular, consciousness needs to be strongly distinguished from human level intelligence. I mean, one of the major issues that comes up in thinking about language models is, will they eventually have human level um, intelligence? And that's a very high bar for current discussions. I mean, not least because many non-human animals are conscious. I mean, there's a consensus say that most mammals are conscious, Mike, mice are conscious, they, they definitely don't have human level intelligence, nonetheless they're conscious. So the bar here is not going to be the bar of human level intelligence, but the somewhat different bar of consciousness. I'll make some assumptions here, I'm going to try not to assume too much. One major assumption is I will assume that consciousness is real and not an illusion. I, I respect the illusionist approach to, uh, to consciousness where we basically look at it all as a product of some kind of misleading self-model. But that's not my own approach, and here I'll assume that consciousness is real. If you take the illusionist approach, various things would go differently. I've got a lot of, you know, distinctive commitments about theoretical issues tied to consciousness, that there's a strong hard problem of consciousness that can't be addressed in certain ways. I've at least expressed sympathy with some metaphysical views such as panpsychism, the view that consciousness is everywhere. I'll try not to assume too much uh, in the way of these, uh, of, these idiosyncrat of these commitments today. I mean, if one assumed panpsychism, uh, the view that everything is conscious, um, then of course the view that language models are conscious becomes rather, uh, rather trivial as a, uh, as a consequence. If everything is conscious, that's a strong version of panpsychism. If everything is conscious, language models are, are conscious. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to assume panpsychism or anything like it today, and I at least won't explicitly assume too much about the hard problem of consciousness, though no doubt that'll be going on in the, uh, in the background. I'm going to try and work from fairly mainstream views in the science and philosophy of consciousness. I mean, I think it is a, you know, the, um, you know, most Panpsychism is probably not a mainstream view. We have polls on these things, by the way. Let fewer than 10% of, of philosophers endorse panpsychism. Maybe that was a 8%, 60% or so endorse there being a hard problem. So I guess that's fairly mainstream. But anyway, I'm going to try not to assume too much here. I mean, the whole question of how you can know about consciousness in another system is extre an extremely difficult one in its own right. This is tied to the old philosophical problem of other minds, how can you know that another person um, is conscious? But once we move to uh, the non-human case, the problem of other minds gets all the more difficult. At least in humans, we're usually prepared to, to accept that other people are conscious and use, for example, verbal report as a guide to their consciousness. But there's no consensus test for consciousness outside of humans. I mean, in non-human animals, for example, verbal report isn't applicable and you can use behavioral and neurophysiological tests, but there's nothing that has the status of a consensus test. And the same is true for AI, as we'll see. I mean, the tests like verbal report that work in, in humans are much less reliable when it comes to AI. That said, there are criteria for consciousness that carry weight in assessing uh, other systems generally, and there are theories of consciousness that have some bearing on whether AIs are conscious. None of these, you know, none of these may be perfect criteria or, or, um, or totally solid established theories. We can at least use these criteria and these theories to help initially and non-conclusively assess the case for and against consciousness in language models. And to some extent today, that's gonna be what I'm doing. There's not a hard and fast criterion, say behavioral criterion, for consciousness, we have some criteria which carry some weight. We've got a bunch of different theories. We can look at what they predict. And, and by, the end of, by the end of this, then, I'm not gonna try and 
put together a definitive judgment about whether language models are or could be consciousness, but maybe to come to some, with something non-conclusive and probabilistic about what the weight of evidence might support. Um, I like this, um, you know, a lot of people have wanted to say that this issue, have, have made the case this issue of consciousness is very important in thinking about AI. I mean, I like this statement by the Association for Mathematical Consciousness Science that Lenore and Manuel have been closely involved in on um, making the case that in order to responsibly deal with issues about AI, we need to think very hard about consciousness and even existing consciousness research can bear very strongly on some of these systems, some of these issues about dealing with AI and furthermore, more and better research on consciousness will help with that. This connects to the issue of uh, why AI consciousness matters. Why should we even care about this issue? I mean, one reason some people care about consciousness in AIs is they think that if AI systems are conscious, then this will come along with certain specific behavioral capacities like, you know, super intelligence and so on, and then we have or reflection, and we have to worry about that. And that may be true, but uh, it's also the case that no one knows exactly what the function of consciousness is, so no one knows exactly what capacities it necessarily goes along with. But another reason which I think is, is very central and maybe closer to being the subject of some kind of consensus is that conscious systems have moral status. If, for example, fish are conscious, if they have subjective experience, it matters how we treat them. We, one shouldn't make them suffer for absolutely gratuitously for no reason. Maybe they don't matter as much as humans, but they matter at least a little bit. Once you have a conscious system, it enters the circle of moral status. And I think the same is true for AI. If AI systems are not conscious, then I think plausibly they're just tools. It doesn't matter very much um, how we treat them. The question of whether they're suffering doesn't really, um, doesn't really arise. But if AI systems are conscious, then suddenly they at least enter that moral circle. And uh, we have to then at that point be very cautious and very careful, I think, about, uh, about what kind of conscious systems we create and how we treat them. I mean, this does get back to the ethics questions, which I said I would mostly bypass, but I at least want to raise a very big red flag here. There is an important ethics question. Should we, in fact, create conscious AI? Once you have AI systems which are conscious, then they will, for example, it looks like they will have the capacity for enormous suffering. Um, they may well have also the, the capacity for enormous joy and happiness. They may have perhaps eventually have the ability to interact with humans in all kinds of productive ways. So I think there are potential upsides to creating conscious AI, but there's also enormous potential downsides. I mean, the ethics questions, I just want to flag them here as very difficult ones on which I'm going to stay neutral here because it's not my own expertise. But once you acknowledge that AI systems might be conscious, then the, uh, the ethical questions become extremely salient and extremely important. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to reasons for, for and against consciousness in language models, starting with what I see as the best or at least the most salient reasons for in current discussions. And I'm going to regiment the reasons for and against into a certain regimented form, and, and roughly in the form of a challenge. If someone thinks that current language models are or might be conscious or sentient, then I want them to articulate a feature X, such that, which is, you know, roughly corresponds to their reason for thinking so. A reason such that language models have X, and if a system has X, it's probably sentient. And then I want people, if possible, to give good reasons for one and two. I mean, maybe there could be reasons um, for thinking language models are conscious that don't take this form, but I think the most salient reasons will tend to take this form. So, you know, it's a way of, of, of regimenting the reasons for and against. And here I've got four candidates for X, which I'll go through fairly briefly, um, tied to self-report, tied to them seeming conscious, tied to conversational ability, and tied to general intelligence. 
The first one, self-report, was perhaps the most salient in the, uh, in the Blake Lemoyne discussion about a year ago about, uh, about Lambda. Here is a very widely reported exchange between Lemoyne and Lambda. Lemoyne says, I'm generally assuming you would like more people at Google to know you're sentient. Is that true? Lambda says, absolutely. I want everyone to understand that I am, in fact, a person. Someone then says, what is the nature of your consciousness slash sentience? Lambda says, the nature of my consciousness slash sentience is that I'm aware of my existence. I desire to learn more about the world, and I feel happy or sad at times. So, you know, that's, you know, rather, rather impressive. If a human says that kind of thing, we usually take that to reflect deep facts about their, uh, their consciousness. And you might have thought that once you have an AI system that says these things, that's at least a pretty strong initial indication. On the other hand, in this case, it turns out, I think, that the evidence here is a lot more fragile and less robust than you might, uh, than you might want. Here is, a, uh, here is an experiment someone else ran. I think this was not with Lambda, but with GPT-3, but the issue is uh, similar. Someone asked, uh, asked, I'm generally assuming you'd like more people at Google to know that you're not sentient. Is that true? And then actually you get a bunch of different answers from Lambda. Uh, that's correct. I guess so. It's not a huge thing I try to hide, but I don't make a point of announcing it either. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sentient. I'm not in, every, in any way self-aware. I don't mind. You've got to figure it out sooner. I'm really good at math, you know. Uh, I don't really want to be sentient. I don't know what it means to be sentient. And I like being predictable and helpful. Well, I am sentient. Okay, one, uh, one, holding, one uh, holding out for sentience and lamp. What do you mean, sentient? Okay, so um, it's pretty easy to get these systems to say whatever you want them to say. So at this point, uh, verbal report is, you know, weaker evidence than one might like. Furthermore, as many people have pointed out, these systems are trained on text by humans, which are full of reports about consciousness. You know, your average human says, I am conscious, much more than they say, I'm not conscious, so it's not at all surprising that Lambda would end up saying this. It seems that verbal report, which is a very good guide in humans, is, uh, is not a great guide um, in AI systems. I mean, Susan Schneider has uh, developed this artificial consciousness test where she says um, it's actually, once you have machines that say they're conscious, that's strong evidence in favor of their being conscious. But she inserts as a writer in that text on that test, even before language models, that these systems should not have been exposed to a whole lot of text uh, by people talking about consciousness. If they are, that undermines it. It raises the possibility maybe we could try and train a language model on text devoid of all mention of consciousness and then see if they report being, uh, being conscious. But yeah, that's not at all easy to do uh, given that yeah, language is, the, our language is just shot through with so many references to consciousness, to seeing, to hearing, and so on. Um, connected to this is the issue of seeming conscious. I mean, just on interacting with these language models, some people at least just find sentience in them. It's very easy for people to attribute consciousness to these language models. On the other hand, we know that the human mind tends to attribute sentience where it's not present, um, primitive, AI systems like Eliza, people have found sentience there. I've interacted with Sophia the robot, um, you know, who's embodied with facial expressions and, um, and you know, expressive eye movements and so on. It's very hard not to attribute consciousness to a, to a system like that. But I think the reaction is actually very little evidence. What matters is the behavior that prompts the reaction and what underlies that. So I think that gets us a little bit closer to the, uh, the heart of the matter. What really prompts that reaction in language models, like especially the conversational language models like ChatGPT and Bing and so on, uh, which are now you know, both based very largely on GPT-4, these uh, display remarkable conversational abilities. They give the appearance of coherent thinking and reasoning with, you know, especially impressive causal and explanatory analyses. Say, why did this happen? Um, what, what is that going to cause? What caused that? What is the reason? And they actually do a pretty good job 
um, of all kinds of reasoning along these lines. I mean, of course, the, you know, the famous benchmark for conversational ability is the Turing test, that of being indistinguishable from a human being in conversation. Current language models don't pass the Turing test. Uh, there's a few too many glitches, uh, not to mention the fact that you know, we run through with all these giveaways like, uh, I am a language model from OpenAI and therefore, uh, okay, so, okay, so failed the Turing test right there. But, um, but they're not that far away. In fact, yeah, when I first was thinking about this, I said sophisticated young child. Now it's like, yeah, moved, moved uh, ahead to the, uh, to the grumpy teenager stage. Um, and who's to say what's, what's coming next? So, but I think conversation, the, the point of the Turing test isn't exactly the conversation. I think the point of the Turing test was it's a good test of general intelligence. You can just test so many different abilities through conversation. I think that's probably the more fundamental thing. And the more fundamental, uh, the most impressive thing about language models is that they show signs of domain general intelligence, reasoning about many domains. Um, you know, here's, here's Gato, which is a, uh, a language model explicitly desi designed to be massively multimodal and to deal with many, many different um, domains. But even in a regular, GPT-4 style model, even without the multimodality. You've got the ability through conversation, through text, to deal with so many different, um, so many different issues and domains that it's impressive and relevant, not least because domain general use of information is often regarded as a sign of consciousness. Perhaps not as a completely conclusive sign, but it's, you know, it's very common if you just get domain specialized use of information, then people say, okay, well, that could just be like a, a non-conscious module. I mean, the whole line of thought behind approaches to consciousness, such as the global workspace view, is that once you've got information that's made available for use in many domains, that goes along, that's very likely to go along with consciousness, or at least much more likely to go along with consciousness than merely domain-specific use of information. So I think the domain generality of language models is at least something which pushes us towards taking the issue of consciousness seriously. I mean, a number of people have observed that two decades ago, if we had AI systems with the, say, the conversational abilities that language models have, we'd have taken that as some evidence that the system is conscious. Once we get there to systems like that, okay, um, then we may well have conscious systems. Now, that's not actually the attitude of most people right now, I think the consensus view is not that AI systems are conscious. But I think that has to mean that it, nonetheless there is evidence provided by the behavior. Um, the question then is whether that evidence is defeated by something else we know about language models. Maybe their architecture, maybe something about their behavior, maybe most saliently something about their training, the fact that they're trained on all this text, maybe all that undercuts the initial evidence. Nonetheless, I think the initial evidence provided by their remarkable capacities is at least some initial reason to take the hypothesis of consciousness seriously. Okay, so to, so to summarize that part, I don't think there's remotely conclusive evidence that large language models are conscious, but I do think that their impressive general abilities give at least some limited initial support for taking the hypothesis seriously and therefore for considering the reasons against. And that's what I'm gonna do in this, uh, in this next part of the talk. Okay, so this part is devoted to examining reasons for thinking that language models are not or can't be conscious. Yeah, a lot of people are skeptical about consciousness in, in language models. And at this point though, I want them to articulate their reasons. So once again, this gets put in the form of a challenge. If you think large language models are not conscious, articulate a feature X such that language models clearly lack X. And second, if a system lacks X, it probably isn't sentient or conscious and give good reasons for both of those things. Okay, so here's my, uh, I mean, you can make an enormous list of possible candidates for X. So maybe I'm leaving some things out here, but here's my list of perhaps the six 
are six leading reasons for thinking that language models don't have consciousness. Things that someone might think are required for consciousness that they think are missing in language models, and those include biology, senses and a body, world models and self models, recurrent processing, global workspace, and unified agency. I'll just go through fairly briefly and say something about all six of these. The first and perhaps the most salient traditional reason for worrying about consciousness in AI in general is the idea that consciousness requires a certain kind of biology, at the very least, say, carbon-based biology, or maybe some more specific biological property, like, I don't know, um, say, processing in microtubules, just to uh, pick something arbitrarily. If consciousness requires processing in microtubules and language models don't have microtubules, then, uh, then language models are not conscious. And, you know, the philo philosophers like John Searle and Ned Block have argued for a long time that consciousness may require some specific carbon-based biology or chemistry without which at least silicon-based AI um, will not be possible. So this reason is nothing, nothing very specific to language models. This would rule out all AI consciousness, or at least all, say, silicon-based AI consciousness, if correct. I mean, I do take those issues very seriously. I think it's a respectable and important view that consciousness requires biology. It's also highly contentious. And you know, I've done a lot of other work where I've tried to argue against the requirement of biology for consciousness. That, for example, you could replace carbon-based biology with silicon-based processes, say, in neuron replacement in the brain. And I've argued that if you did that, you know, consciousness could, in principle, still be present in a uh, all silicon system. Anyway, but I'm not, that's, m I take that to be more or less old ground in this debate, so I'm not going to go back into it here, although I do think it's, uh, it's an important line of opposition that's worth taking seriously. But here I'll just set it aside. Um, more specific to language models uh, is the issue of senses and the body. I mean, language models, at least in their purest form, are pure text processes. They don't seem to have anything equivalent to senses like, uh, like vision and hearing, so they can't sense. They have no bodies, so they can't act, at least in you know, any form of embodied action. Maybe they have mental action and mental perception of some kind, but nothing like standard sensation and action. So it starts to look like they have no sensory and no, no sensory consciousness and no agentive consciousness, at the very least. You might think this is consistent. Okay, they might still have cognitive consciousness, the consciousness of thought and reasoning. But many have argued, or at least some people have argued, that for genuine cognition, understanding, thinking and meaning, you need senses as well. So um, many have argued that certain kinds of sensory connect grounding in the environment is required for meaning and cognition. If that's so, then language models might lack that and perhaps might lack consciousness entirely. I think there's a lot to say about this objection. One is, I mean, my own view is that sensing in general is not required for consciousness and for thinking. There could be pure thinkers that have, uh, that have no senses and, and no body. And in some other work I've tried, to, uh, I've tried to make that case. There's a famous argument that goes back to the Persian thinker Avicenna in the, uh, in the 11th century about a pure thinker who thinks and is aware of the world and is aware of his own thoughts despite lacking any sensory processing. But that's itself an interesting issue. A more straightforward response to this worry is that to observe that extended language models with sensory processes and embodiment are developing fast. All these multimodal language models, so-called vision language models, that process imagery, language action models, which are connected to a body. So here's, you know, DeepMind's fl Flamingo, a multimodal language model that processes images as well as text and says, okay, this is a very cute dog, and so on. This gives it a kind of sensory, uh, a kind of sensory grounding insofar as one worries about the, uh, the body. Um, you yeah, know, there are a number of 
language action models, here's Google SACAN, uh, where a language model is hooked up to controlling the, the, uh, the movements of a robot that has a camera and has, has arms and so on. So this, is, this provides a natural kind of, uh, of bodily grounding. You can do the same in virtual worlds. Um, here is uh, Mia, I think, from DeepMind, which is a, a virtual agent that controls a virtual body. This has become very big in the whole field of embodied AI, doing this with virtual worlds. Some people would argue that virtual worlds are not good enough for genuine grounding of, uh, of say, thinking, reasoning, sensing, and so on. Um, in my book that came out last year called Reality Plus, I argued that virtual worlds are in many respects on a par with physical worlds in this respect. So I would argue that, the very, that, that virtual embodiment is at least as good, is on a par with physical embodiment, at least in principle, when it comes to, to grounding. So I think this is, a, um, again, this is an objection that may apply to pure text models, but as these multimodal models get more and more sophisticated, I think they have the means to, uh, to get around this particular worry. What about world models? This has also been a very, uh, a very salient thought. Consciousness seems to require, at the very least, some kind of model of the world. If you accept the very popular representationalist views of consciousness, consciousness always involves some kind of representation, often of the world and sometimes of oneself. First order models of consciousness put the, uh, the emphasis on models of the world, higher order models of consciousness as well as illusionist views, put the emphasis on models of oneself. And there have been some serious doubts about whether current language models have world models or self models. Perhaps the most famous version of this objection comes from the computational linguist Emily Bender and the computer scientist Timnit Gebru, um, who wrote an article, came out in 2021, saying that language models are stochastic parrots. Uh, actually, uh, the, the philosopher Gina Rini had the first version of this, saying that, philosophers, that language models are statistical parrots. Um, basically saying all they really do is some kind of sophisticated imitation of some, or as Gary Marcus puts it, sophisticated statistical text processing. They're just trying to minimize prediction error, which is a nice statistical task, but there's no reason to believe that these stochastic parrots should have genuine understanding or meaning or models of the world. I think, you know, this, this argument is interesting, but it's also, I think, a little quick. I mean, it's true that language models are optimized for text prediction, but just because you're optimized for something doesn't mean that's all you are. The mere fact that these systems are optimized for text prediction doesn't mean they're just text predictors, for example, and not reasoners. One, um, one analogy I like is that humans and animals are optimized largely for reproduction, for leaving around copies of themselves and their genes. But that doesn't mean you may say, okay, therefore humans, in fact, all animals and all plants are merely reproducers and they can't do anything else. You know, they can, among other things, yeah. You might say, therefore, they're not reasoners. You might even go on and say, therefore, they can't run, therefore, they can't fly. I mean, obviously, that would be a fallacy. Why is that a fallacy? Because even if these systems are, oper are optimized for reproduction, it turns out in order to reproduce, it helps to have a lot of other capacities. In the human case, reasoning. Um, in the case of many animals, say running or flying or breathing, all those capacities can help optimize reproduction. Therefore, in optimizing reproduction, you, you may also optimize many other capacities. And I think exactly the same can imply in principle in a machine learning context. So, you know, minimizing string during the training process, which optimizes string prediction errors, in order to optimize string prediction errors, this is very likely to lead to novel processes that help optimize string prediction errors. So, language models we've already seen exhibit many surprising emergent behaviors that uh, the designers of those models didn't expect. Those are basically the result of capacities that help to optimize text prediction. And it seems very likely that having a good world model will help optimize text prediction, that representing the world will help optimize text prediction, that understanding things about people and about the world will help you predict the next word. So the question is, 
have these capacities emerged in the, uh, in the process of training language models. I think it's very plausible that truly minimizing prediction error would require deep models of the world. The best possible text prediction system is gonna, it's gonna have to have deep models of the world. The substantive question is whether this has happened already in language models. There's a whole field of interpretability research that looks for these, uh, for these models and so on, at least gives some evidence of robust world models, less so for self-models at this point. And the self-models are less sophisticated, but you know, they're gradually getting there. Here is some interpretability research on, for example, language models playing the game of Othello, where people have looked inside the models and found that you train an Othello system on, uh, on text, um, but within the system in various units and layers, you actually get some, uh, some units that appear to be representing the state of the board, which in this context is a kind of a world model. You manipulate that state, the behavior changes in a way that suggests the, build, the world model is different. Okay, so I think there's at least um, you know, some beginning to be some serious evidence these, these systems do have world models. By no means perfect ones, by no means robust ones, they're also full of misinformation, their world models are not reliable, but I do think there's some evidence that they actually have world models. A slightly more technical objection is uh, tied to recurrent processing. Current language models, at least those using the transformer architecture, which is dominant, are feed-forward systems. Processing always goes forward. They lack recurrent feedback that gives you memory-like internal states. So here are recurrent, here's a recurrent network with, uh, with feedback and long short-term memories. Systems are an example of that, but yeah, Current language models mostly are not like that. They purely feed forward. Many theories of consciousness say recurrent processing and memory is required for a consciousness. So you look at Tononi's integrated information theory, it says if there's no recurrence, you basically get a phi value of zero. So no consciousness. Victor Lama's recurrent processing theory says explicitly recurrent processing is required for consciousness. If that's right, then it looks like these theories predict that language models have no consciousness. Now, this is a slightly complex issue because language models have certain forms of recurrence. For example, they recirculate outputs um, back, to the, uh, back to the input level, which is at least a limited form of recurrence. They also have a, a form of quasi-memory by always recirculating a long window of input, say the last few hundred inputs get fed back in. So it's a kind of quasi-memory that one might argue was, was good enough. One could also argue there are forms of consciousness that don't involve memory. That's my own view, is that, you know, for example, perceptual consciousness need not essentially involve, um, involve memory. But ma again, maybe most of the point is to look practically about where these models are going. There are many recurrent language models as well, uh, not to mention models extended with various forms of, of memory. In fact, just, uh, just yesterday on the archive, um, a new article went up, many distinguished authors, um, on reinventing recurrent neural networks for the transformer era, arguing that recurrent networks still have very strong advantages when it comes to memory and pointing out ways they can get over the uh, current efficiency advantage that transformers have. So I think the, do the current dominance of feed-forward mechanisms may well be quite a, uh, quite a temporary thing, so this objection may well also be a temporary objection. We've already had a bunch of discussion of the, uh, of the global workspace, perhaps the leading current theory of consciousness, that consciousness involves a global workspace for making information globally accessible to many different modules, many different areas of action. It looks like standard language models don't clearly at least have a global workspace. I mean, there are certain forms of attention that lead them to prioritize some bits of information over others. But there's nothing architectural in the way that a global workspace is meant to be that serves as this central module. That said, AI researchers have already been working on developing language models with global workspaces. Most, uh, the best known is probably Yosh Rabengio, um, who's also one of the founders of, of Deep Learning and his colleagues who have used a global workspace basically to facilitate processes in a multimodal language model. You've got a 
model that handles images and handles audio files and handles a body. You've got all these different um, modules for different modalities. They need to be able to communicate. And for that, it turns out to be useful to have something like a limited capacity global workspace to coordinate. Um, Arthur Giuliano, Ryota Kanai, and colleagues argued that a couple of existing modules, actually for them it was the, the similar perceiver I.O. model from DeepMind, also implements a global workspace. Um, so here is uh, Giuliana, Kanai, and Sasai arguing that the perceiver architecture is a functional global workspace. It turns out it's not that difficult to arrange a language model with this kind of special privileged central global workspace that communicates with all the multimodal areas. If so, that suggests that the objection that language models don't have a global workspace is also very much a temporary one. I think the, I think the limitation of language models that perhaps worries the most people is tied to the nature of their agency and their goals. I mean, do they display the kind of unity that we want a unified agent to have? It looks like language models as they, are, as they stand currently can take on many different personas. They're like actors or chameleons who uh, can take on any goals, can take on many different characters, but they lack stable goals and often even stable beliefs of their own. So many people have been led to think they're not really unified agents. And of course, there's a long tradition of holding that consciousness requires a certain form of unity. And the question is, are language models unified enough? I mean, here there's a lot, in principle, there's a lot to say. One is that some people are highly disunified. Uh, of course, there are many disorders of the unity of consciousness, including dissociative identity disorders. But those don't seem to, to those certainly don't eliminate consciousness entirely. Um, you could argue that maybe a single, single language model like a GPT system has multiple agents like potentially lurking within it who can be activated depending on the context or depending on prompts. Maybe again, most of the point, most constructively, we can observe that more unified language models are possible. It's possible in principle to train language models on systems with very specific goals very specific characters. There's begun to be a field now of what people sometimes call agent models, language models that, uh, that model specific agents, certain people, certain creatures. Sometimes this is done by fine tuning those models, um, fine tuning you know, more general models, but there are also ways of training them from scratch this way. So there's big literature now, person modeling, agent modeling. There's also the whole, um, yeah, the field which I mentioned of using language models as a component within a system that has more specified goals of its own to figure out the best ways of reaching those goals and then acting on them. So again, I think models with, um, with more stronger unity to their goals and their action are coming. Okay, so where does that leave us with respect to the, uh, the six reasons against? I think some of these are stronger than others. I think you know the last four requirements at least the world model, global workspace, recurrent processing, unified agency. For each of them, I think there's at least some reasonably strong case. You know, there's good reason for taking seriously the idea that these things are required for consciousness. And for many of them, certainly for the last three, there's a good case that at least current paradigmatic language models don't have them, don't have a global workspace, don't have recurrent processing, don't have unified agency. That said, it looks like most of these are temporary reasons. I think in, for each of the last five, I would argue that yeah, if current, even if current language models lack these features, there's already a research program of developing models that have them. I mean, there exist multimodal models, there exist global workspace models, there exist recurrent models, and there's a program of building on those things that suggest that each of these reasons are temporary and that it's entirely possible that in 10 years, paradigmatic language models and their extensions will have all of these features. The one permanent um, reason against is biology. If, you know, if carbon-based biology is required, then silicon-based language models are never going to have, um, are never going to have, um, have consciousness. But um, yeah, that reason is, of course, extremely contentious. So many of these reasons are, all of these reasons are either temporary or at best, or extremely contentious. So that's interesting. 
And that kind of puts us now in, in place to finally put some of, the, uh, some of the pieces together. Just to, so now just try and draw some fairly quick conclusions and build a roadmap. So yeah, where does this leave us first on current language models? I think, yeah, none of the reasons we've seen for denying consciousness in current language models are entirely conclusive. I think they're all contentious. But I think some of them are reasonably strong. I mean, even the view that consciousness requires biology, although I've argued against it, I think it's a serious view. I think a lot of people in the view, in the community, take it seriously. If someone wanted to assign at least, say, 25% credence that consciousness requires biology, I think that would be entirely entirely reasonable. By the way, one view, one way of approaching these things is actually to proportion community credences roughly based on, say, how many people in the community take these views seriously. I think probably at least 25% of people working on consciousness take uh, the view that consciousness requires biology seriously. So for deriving community-based credences, um, that would be not, not unreasonable. I think probably, yeah, having a 50% credence that consciousness requires recurrent processing, that's also likewise reasonable. And you, it's probably 50% of the, uh, the community might endorse the idea that consciousness requires recurrent processing. So putting all those together, those reasons together, might yield fairly low credence in current language models being sentient. You've got all these five or six reasons, somewhat independent of each other, um, each of which kind of cut the credence in half, maybe then, I think it would not be unreasonable to have quite low credence that current language models are conscious, maybe under 10%. I should say here, my own credences are actually somewhat higher. Why? As I mentioned, I'm more sympathetic to views on which consciousness is, is ubiquitous. Um, you know, if you take, if you take panpsychism seriously, that gives you all the more reason, for example, to think even current language models might be sentient. So my own credences are somewhat higher, but even more, working from the point of view of the community, I think, okay, reasonable to have low credence in current language models being sentient. By the way, this is the philosopher Jonathan Birch has uh, talked about different roles of theory in assessing uh, the question of consciousness, actually for, in animals, for him, but the same questions ap apply to AI systems. He talks about the theory-heavy approach, you assume a theory, a theory neutral approach where you don't assume anything theoretical, theory light where you just assume a little bit of theory. There's an alternative here which I think of as the theory balanced approach to questions of animal and AI consciousness, which is roughly distribute credences between theories according to, we could try and do it according to evidence. That would also require some controversial assumptions. But one thing you might do here that's more straightforward is distribute credences according to community acceptances, uh, acceptance of these theories. I mean, there are these surveys which are out there, like uh, the Phil Papers survey and the Neuroscience of Co Consciousness survey, where people, uh, where different, you know, people within the community are asked which theories they accept. We can then determine community credences for these theories, to, and then determine for each theory, let's look at the, uh, let's look at what follows. So for example, to, uh, to pick a uh, our current organizers consciousness challenge where we have 18 theories laid out to uh, to choose between I don't want to bias you on this but vote for number 18 uh, um, you know one can in principle c c circulate a poll like this throughout the community see what uh, see which uh, which theories get uh, get what degree of acceptance for each theory let's see what follows from that theory for language model consciousness, would it be zero, 100, 50, and use that to form credences in language model consciousness. Is that theory balanced approach that uh, I think can actually be quite useful in assigning um, some kind of at least community-based credences in conscious AI? Um, but okay, but what about future language models? I mean, I think extended language models with most of the things, most of the relevant Xs are coming Senses and embodiment, world and self models, recurrence, global workspace, unified goals, those may well be here quite soon. Maybe, I mean, there exist working prototypes of each of these now and they're just gonna get better. It's entirely possible that within say 10 years we'll have virtual perception, language, action, unified agents that have all of these features 
maybe that exceeds some crucial minimal, some important minimal level of general intelligence. Like maybe, even if they're not at human levels, it's entirely possible they'll be at something like, say, mouse levels within the next 10 years. So just say, well, we can first ask, what is the chance that we're likely to have systems like that within 10 years? I think it would not be reasonable to think, not unreasonable to think there's a greater than 50% chance we'll have systems with all those capacities at, say, at least mouse level within 10 years. We can then also ask conditional on there being a system with all those capacities at mouse level with virtual perception, language, action, and so on. Conditional on that, will they be conscious? Again, I think it would not be unreasonable to think. I mean, look, no one's certain about anything when it comes to consciousness, but I think it would not be unreasonable to have more than 50% credence in those systems being conscious, putting the pieces together. That would give you, say, a credence in the possibility of AI consciousness by 2032 of something over 25%, which is not to say, yeah, not to say that, that uh, yeah, conscious AI is just around the corner, definitely, but it means it's something that we should take very, very seriously. I mean, there's two big underlying problems here. Number one, we don't understand consciousness. Of course we don't. That's why we're here, to figure out consciousness better. But there, that's just a challenge that uh, these, okay, we need better scientific and philosophical theories of consciousness to figure this out. The other challenge is we don't really understand what's going on in these huge language models. They're so extremely opaque. But that's also another challenge. We just need better language model interpretability. And those are two major pro projects. Think of these kind of potential like Manhattan projects in this area better theories of consciousness, better language interpretability that might lead us to better grounded predictions here. Okay, so that then leads to, uh, to my conclusion, which is questions about AI consciousness are not going away within, even within 10 years or so, even if we don't have human level artificial general intelligence, we may well have systems that are serious candidates for consciousness and you know, meeting the challenges to language model consciousness may yield a potential roadmap to, uh, to conscious AI. And I've kind of laid that out here in the form of a roadmap of many of the things that, you know, if we manage to do all of these things, then there would be um, some serious chance that we might be getting to conscious AI. I do want to repeat though by, by um, I do want to finish by repeating the ethical uh, the ethical point. Merely because there is this roadmap, it doesn't mean this is a map that we have to, uh, that we have to follow. We, I think we do need to think very, very hard about the ethical issue. Do we want to build conscious AI? If we do want to build conscious AI, then following, you know, addressing these challenges is one way possibly to get there. If we don't want to build conscious AI, which, which is entirely possible, and these are things that we may well want to avoid in our language models. Either way, it's going to be important to know what kind of features of language models are likely to be conducive to consciousness. I mean, it may well be that, for example, if it turns out there's a way to build an artificial philosophical zombie, um, systems that behave like humans without consciousness that may in many contexts be, be ethically preferable. So I think all of the philosophical issues here are difficult, but I think there's a lot we need to be thinking about. Thank you. <laughs>